I'm Kim Storfer. Um, I have spent most of my adult life in healthcare uh, for in one aspect or another. Um, I started at a hospital probably way too many years ago. I don't want to don't want to say, but I uh, started at a hospital in the registration area of the emergency room. And um, as I was working there, you know, I started to see the, the how vital capturing the information at registration was. Um, I have often said, and I still say to this day, that the registration staff should probably be the highest paid staff in healthcare. Because if you don't get the information correct up front, there are so many downstream effects um, and so many downstream you know, things that can happen, and, and we'll get into that later. But um, I am a, a huge proponent of making sure uh, that the initial visit for, with that patient is um, vital to get all that information correct. Um, from the hospital, what I did is moved kind of up through different departments. Um, I went from the emergency room registration clerk, like I said, into pre-admissions. So I would register people for pre-surgeries. Um, I would call them on the phone, get their information, um, enter it into the computer. Well, actually, I have to say that when I started there, we didn't have computers. Um, I entered it on paper. <laughs> and while I was working at the hospital, we started um, integrating computers. And we would have to actually um, data entry all of the paper records. So um, I've lived through this whole um, roller coaster ride of electronics. Um, after registration, um, I went to uh, credit and collection. So I started um, helping people try to figure out how to pay their bills um, with you know, either their insurance or um, introduce them to other avenues um, if they didn't have insurance. Um, I also worked with uh, our quality assurance team at the hospital um, and other teams to make sure that the patients uh, visit while they were at the hospital was um, a positive one. Um, you know, going into a hospital obviously is a very scary thought. So um, making it the best possible experience um, is, is very important for patient, um, you know, that patient experience. Um, after the hospital, um, I had some major changes in my life. I went, uh, went through a, a divorce, and I had to move um, up to Buffalo. And I thought, well, I need to find a career that I can support my daughter and myself um, while making you know, enough money. And um, so I opted to go to ECC. Actually, it was kind of like old home week when I came pulled in the driveway. Um, I became a dental hygienist. So for about 15 years, I did dental hygiene. So I've seen also a clinical side of healthcare. Um, and that gives you a completely different perspective. Sure. Did you say 15 years? About 15 years, yep. I did clinic, yep. Where were you before Buffalo with all the stuff before oh, the dental hygiene? Um, yeah. Actually, Fredonia Dunkirk. So I worked at Brooks Hospital. Um, so I became a hygienist, and like I said, I did the clinical side. So very important in capturing a uh, health history of a patient, you know, trying to make sure that they give you all of their information. I know that sometimes patients um, are concerned about giving you information um, that they do not think is relevant to the treatment that they are receiving. And from a dental perspective, that's really true because most people do not understand the correlation between dental and medical health. Um, there's a very strong correlation. Uh, you know, any, any, any uh, medical condition such as diabetes or health, uh, or I'm sorry, heart disease, um, any of those affect your teeth. Actually, Many of them manifest themselves in the mouth first. 
So there are many times that a hygienist can tell that a patient is either pre-diabetic or diabetic based on their gums and um, the health of their gums and the health of their teeth. So it is very important for um, hygienists and dentists and other dental personnel to document that kind of history or that, you know, those things that they see. Um, and then persuade, hopefully, their patients to go follow up with their regular physician. I'm also a huge proponent of making sure that the whole medical um, community is interacting. Um, we don't see medical providers interacting with dental providers on a regular basis, and they probably should. Um, they kind of live in different worlds. They use different systems. Um, so you really, we really want to push or drive um, medicine to be more, you know, overarching across all of these different areas. Universal, yeah. I think what you're seeing, you're seeing a really big push on that now with um, behavioral health. So there's a lot of information being exchanged between medical, you know, uh, what do I want to say, physical health and behavioral health. Um, and I'm going to get into that a little bit later as I talk through what I do now. Um, but I'd love to see a bigger push on um, dental and some of the other, you know, podiatry and some of these other um, medical specialties. I'd like to see a, a bigger collaboration with their medical personnel. I think it would be very important. So after dental, um, I, I kind of knew in my heart of hearts that dental wasn't going to be my end all career. Um, I really, really enjoy more of the business side of healthcare, um, but it was something I needed to do. And um, I am so glad for the experience because it did give me a, a very good insight to the clinical side. Um, so after, as I was a hygienist, I also went to school and became, got my bachelor's degree in um, management because I knew I wanted to drive towards the business side. When I um, graduated with my bachelor's, you go to where do you go for that? I went to Houghton. Where? Houghton. Houghton. Mm -hmm. And um, I, uh, when I graduated with my bachelor's degree, I started looking for some other jobs. Business management, yep. Um, and I was approached by someone who was looking for um, a person to work at a local HIE. Now, mind you, this is almost 10 years ago now, so back then no one knew what an HIE was. Um, I didn't even know really at that time. Uh, you know, I did some research, and I went in for the interview, and I sat across from the executive director and the program manager. And I listened to the vision of building an HIE, a regional HIE, and then eventually a statewide HIE and national. And it just clicked for me, and I knew that's where I was meant to be. Like, I knew I was meant to be in that space. Um, I just feel that this is the right thing to do um, for healthcare. Uh, it, 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 that position was with HealthyLink, yeah. That position was with HealthyLink, yeah. Um, so I, I just think that it, it's so important for information to be available at the point of care. Um, I un completely understand that people are concerned with their, their health information getting, you know, out there. But I think in turn, you know, the, the pros outweigh the cons, I guess, is the way to look at this. Um, and I think that it can save people's lives. And I've seen it save people's lives. Um, I have a story, and I think some of you probably heard my story at, at, at TroCare. Um, my father um, 
actually went through some medical conditions last uh, summer. And um, the doctors weren't talking. Um, he, you know, my mom is a nurse. She's been a nurse for 50 years. She kept, she kept impeccable records. Um, my father has had a hist or had a history of heart disease, diabetes. So he was your classic case of a patient that needs that collaboration between medical personnel. Um, and they weren't doing it. Um, my mom would take a suitcase full of records to every appointment. She would take a box full of medications to every appointment and go through everything every single time they would see somebody. Some were concerned and they would, be, they would care and others would be like, I don't want to know that. I don't need to know that. That's none of my business. Well, it is your business. You know, they, everything in the body is connected in some way and it's very important to have the whole puzzle in front of you to make a diagnosis. So um, my father ended up with a uh, sinus infection. And he went to the sinus, you know, an ENT, and the infection just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And the ENT finally said, I can't treat him anymore. You need to take him to a specialist. So he went to um, Shan's Hospital in Tampa. This is in Florida. My parents live in Florida. It's a good thing you remember this story. Um, my parents uh, lived in Florida, and they lived in Ocala, which was about an hour and a half away from Tampa. And um, they, this ENT specialist or this ENT told them, go to a specialist at Shans. We can't help him anymore. He went to Shans, and he was admitted. Um, and luckily, the emergency room physician at Shans wanted to help him and wanted to know as much information as possible. He started running additional tests. They started, um, you know, inquiring more about his health history and how everything worked. Unfortunately, it was probably too late. He had already developed a staph infection that ultimately killed him. So I still think to this day that if people would have been more willing to look at the history and hopefully help him, um, you know, he may be alive today. And, I, and I've heard hundreds of these stories. And I'm sure you all have someone in your, um, you know, that you know that has been through something similar. Hopefully didn't end in the same, you know, ending, but that, that having that knowledge would have helped either cure them quicker or help them, their quality of life or, you know, so it is so important to have this information at our fingertips. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about Healthy Link. I know I kind of go off on little tangents. I'm sorry. Well, I'll get to that in a second because that's a change from Healthy Link. So Healthy Link, I spent... Um, almost 10 years at Healthy Link. I started out as a um, operations analyst. And what that was is I took all of the incoming information from um, local medical centers, hospitals, doctor's offices, whatever, whoever was sending us electronic data, and I matched it into our system. So if Kim Storfer went to ECMC, and then Kim Storfer went to Buffalo General Hospital. We need to make sure that they're the same Kim Storfer in the system, um, or the MPI, Master Patient Index. I'm not sure if you guys have, I assume you've learned about those. Um, so I was kind of managing the, the, the MPI. I was there about six months, and I realized um, that it would be extremely beneficial for me to understand how the data comes in. Not just play with it and, and you know, try to figure out how to fix it once it's there, but how can we um, prevent the mistakes before they get to the MPI? So I asked my boss if I could work on an implementation of one of these data sources. Um, so actually, I think 
ECMC might have been my first one. Um, and then I had, at the same time, was doing Roswell and a couple of others. But I found that to be so beneficial because um, knowing the data that these institutions send either to providers or to an HIE or anywhere is, is extremely important. Um, they all send it just a little bit different. Um, even though there's standards um, of sending data, um, HL7 is one standard um, that you see. But the problem is, is people interpret the standards a little bit differently. So you can talk to three different hospitals that say they're following HL7 V2 standards, but they may be a little bit different. Um, so understanding that piece was extremely important. And what I started to do, um, and I found that this was like, now I'm really finding my niche. Like I really loved the data piece. Um, so I started really doing more implementations as well as managing the MPI. And um, I ended up building a team of interface analysts where we would analyze data before it was integrated and try to make it more uniform across data sources or across um, healthcare entities. And did you analyze at each facility? Like, did you analyze ECMC's data and how it was sent, and then Roswell's data and how it was sent? Yep. To and, then and how it differed from the st like how it differed from the standards. So, in in what I mean by that is, for example. Um, no, you, it's, it's usually on phone calls and you see, um, based on, when you build interfaces, you're building VPNs where you're sending data securely from one place to another. Um, and we had test environments that were secure um, so that we could actually look at the data as it was coming in. Um, so you don't actually have to go there, um, but you, know, you start to know what systems send data and how they send it. Um, a lot of hospitals in Western New York utilize, you know, a similar system, but there's also many different ones. So just understanding, uh, you know, that Meditech versus Cerner versus, you know, some of the other systems, they send it a little bit differently. So what I started to do is actually, um, we did a whole uh, analysis of, you know, in, in the PV1 segment or in the PD12 segment or whatever segment of this HL7 standard, um, we would actually track what is the hospital sending in that field. Um, and they might all be, you know, trying to get to the same end notation, but they're using it a little differently. And what I mean by that is, um, for example, if you want to um, send some information on an ER visit, you send an AO4 message, and that's an HL7 standard. In that AO4 message are different fields, and that the fields can be patient class or patient um, uh, location or something like that. The problem is these different hospitals use different standards for those data elements. So one hospital might say ED for the emergency room, might say, one might say ER, one might just say E. So now you have to build kind of crosswalks across all these different systems sending you data to say, okay, ED, E, ER and whatever else they might send equals emergency room. So that now when you're looking at it in one system, they're all uniform. Is that because each facility was using like a different EMR? Is that where the information was being sent? Um, it, yes, that's part of it. Um, and part of it is just based on what they've always done. Now remember, most of these hospitals, you know, were, they're using paper and they're transforming what they did in paper into an, uh, to a system. Yes, systems are different, so that's a very big key piece. 
but also their workflow might have been slightly different in how they identified their departments. I mean, even emergency room. Like, I grew up saying emergency room. Now it's ED, you know. So they've also transformed those, those you know, keywords or those languages. So it, it's just a matter of translation, I guess. Um, so when we say standards, it, it, I say standards very loosely because it might be standard, but it's not standard. Um, so I've always thought that that is ve a very big piece um, and v something very important for probably all of you as students to look at um, as you're going forward is, you know, how do we integrate real standards? How do we um, try to get everyone to use the same language? When they're, when they're talking about these messages. So just something to think about um, as you kind of go through your, your careers. So um, I started to get really involved in the data quality and you know, understanding the data. Um, and I also managed, like I said, the, the MPI. So I had a department of 13, I think, at one time. Um, half of them managed the MPI and half of them brought in data. Um, and um, we just, you know, tried to make it as efficient and as uniform as possible. We developed processes um, that we could use across every data source that came in. So we, you know, would create packets that when we bought, when a new hospital wanted to come on, and send their data to Healthy Link, we would have a process that they would all follow. We ended up getting to, you know, to the point where we could integrate a data feed in like a month and a half because it was efficient. Um, we would make sure we worked with them. You know, this is what we need to do. We developed a whole testing plan. Um, and that's what you need to do is try to make that data integration as efficient and as uniform as possible. And, and it's not always easy because, as you, as you mentioned, they're coming from different systems, and every system does work a little bit differently. So very important to think of process um, as you're also, you know, working through your career and moving forward. Think of defined processes, ways to make healthcare efficient. So, um, and I also started to work um, at HealthyLink a lot with HIPAA. I became um, a HIPAA certified um, expert, I guess is what you say. Um, went and took a test and, um, you know, because you have to understand how to protect data, how to send it securely, um, how to utilize data um, appropriately, how to help people learn how to use data appropriately, you, you would not believe the amount of people in the healthcare industry that don't even know what HIPAA is or don't know how to access data appropriately. Um, and that's apparent, and I'm sure Liz, you can back me up on this because you, you, know, you worked with this. It's apparent when, um, when I used to get a phone call from a practice or during a regular audit, we would get, we would see that, you know, Jane Smith was looking at her ex-husband and, you know, what he was in the hospital for. That's not appropriate. So, I mean, and, and people would share passwords and people would get their next door neighbor to look at somebody for them because then maybe they wouldn't get caught. One, and I'm sure Liz is very, very big on this, please, if someone ever asks you to use your password, no. <laughs> because the only person that's going to get in trouble in that is you. <laughs> so, um, and, and there are so many ways to track that kind of um, access and those types of things. So, you know, please, please be careful. Um, so, uh, like I said, 10 years at Healthy Link did so many different things, learned so many, uh, so many things about the direction of healthcare, um, where our country is going with healthcare. Um, you know, we did uh, statewide collaborations with other 
HIEs. We communicated with other HIEs. Um, we worked with HIEs across the country. Um, I actually was on the, uh, the board for a nationwide um, user group for the vendor that we were all using at the time. Um, it was at first Axolotl, went to Optum, and then Mirth. Um, those are all HIE vendor names. Um, I, so I ran national um, meetings with other HIEs. Um, there was 26 HIEs involved in this user group. So um, even though we're all trying to, and when I say we all, I'm sorry, the HIEs across the country, um, even though that they're all trying to get to the same end goal, they do it a little bit differently. One big um, key area that you will see that in is um, what we call notifications. Um, what, a couple of years ago, the big thing was let's, no, let's notify providers when their patients are in a healthcare situation that they may not be aware of. So for example, um, a primary care physician to get notified when his patient went to the emergency room for a cardiac event. Now, most likely the emergency room is going to notify his cardiologist if it's a cardiac event, but he may not, or they may not notify their primary care physician. So one of the very important things that an HIE can do is to notify all of the providers that are involved with the care of a patient. Um, and that's done through a subscription. So um, for example, if I was admitted to the emergency room, I have my primary care physician, I have my cardiologist, and I don't really have a cardiologist, but we'll just say we do, um, have these two providers. Both of them need to know where I am for, you know, specific reasons. And um, it's just so difficult for a hospital to know all of the parties to communicate with. So this is where if that hospital is sending data to an HIE, the HIE has a list of subscriptions for every provider that wants to receive them. So the, the Dr. Smith, the um, primary care physician, has sent a list of patients that they want to receive notifications on in the event of some kind of a event. Um, and that could be an emergency room visit, could be an admission to a hospital, could be a discharge to a hospital, could be a di an admission to a rehab facility, any type of admission or discharge or medical event can be notified on because there is a message type for each one of those um, events. So. And now the cardiologist could have also sent a list of patients they want to subscribe to. Now, in most cases, these doctors have patient panels of, you know, 2,000, 4,000, 10,000 patients. They are not going to want to get notifications on every single one of those patients because all they'd be doing is getting an inbox of notifications and they would not be relevant. That's what we call noise. Um, so what they typically do is they narrow the list down to a group of patients that need that, that closer look. Um, you know, you could have your diabetic patients with heart disease. Um, you could have your patients that have been more prone to emergency visits. Um, whatever it is, the do it's the doctor's kind of, um, it it's their call as to how they want to receive the notifications. Um, and we, as we're developing this or, or giving them the ability to get a notification, um, we kind of talk through that with them. Because at first they're very like, I want to get everything. I want to get everything. I want to know every time my patient goes somewhere. 
no, you don't, because you'll just be inundated with so many notifications um, that you'll, you'll not, never be able to keep up with them. So many, many times we would integrate exactly or, you know, implement exactly what they wanted, and within days they'd realize, no, I don't want all these. Um, let's, let's tone it back to just emergency room visits or emergency room admissions, inpatient admissions, those types of things. Those things that they can actually, you know, go and follow up on. Um, so in, in notifications continue to be probably one of the most important things that um, healthcare is looking at today. Um, how do we get that notification or that information to who needs it? So, um, in certain states, yes, because um, of the HIPAA rules and um, like New York State, there is a whole law on notifications of children between certain ages. 